before we pray, I did hear just before the service that um, Julia Johnson's mom died last night. So um, from what I understand, she's really private about it, but would appreciate a word, just letting her know that we care for her, that we love her, that we're praying for her. We don't know any details on the arrangement, but her, her mom passed away at the, I think it was at the hospital in Jacksonville last night. So I think she had two strokes. So let's pray for her and for others in our church and community. Father, as we come this morning, the, um, we, pray, we just start by praying for Julia and her family this morning. We uh, know that she's close, visiting her parents regularly, if not daily. And so uh, losing your parents is hard. And so we lift her up this morning and we pray that you would comfort her with your love, with your spirit, that you would walk alongside her and her family, that you would remind her of the promise of the resurrection that is to come. And so we pray that as she grieves the loss of her mom, that she will grieve in, grieve in hope, um, in hope of the resurrection. We pray for comfort for her and her, for her dad. We pray for comfort for the rest of the family. Lord, this week can be a... Uh, a whirlwind of decisions that need to be made. Uh, and so we pray, God, that you would um, give them the strength um, to walk through this, that you would surround them with people who love them and who care for them. Many of us here today have walked this road many times. And so, God, we, we know what it's like to ache and to hurt at, at a visitation and at a funeral. And so we pray, Lord, great comfort for her. We pray today that you would, out of the goodness of your love, as your word says, that you would uh, save your people. This morning, I don't know the burdens that everybody carries, but I know some of the burdens. And uh, so I pray, God, that, that from your character, that is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, that you would today reach your hand out to save those who are drowning today in guilt. Those who are today wishing they could undo something from this week. God, I pray that you would reach out and save them from the despair that wants to overwhelm the, the guilty heart today. God, I pray that those who come today needing wisdom, that you, the God of wisdom, would give them wisdom about whatever the decisions they need to make are, about the future, about the present. God, I pray that you would, from your wisdom, reach out uh, to rescue those that need wisdom. God, I pray for those who... Uh, carry heavy burdens about whatever, whatever, in whatever other way today. I pray that you would be the God who, out of the goodness of your heart, would reach out. And, but while we wait today, God, I pray that you would help us to worship. While we wait for wisdom, while we wait for help, while we wait for rest, while we wait for comfort, I pray, God, that we would actively choose to see you as you are to take you at your word, as, your, as the Bible tells us, and that we would worship you from this place. God, I, in the places that we are, I pray that in the places that we really are while we're waiting on something, I pray that we would call our family and our friends, that we would call the people that are around us to worship alongside us because you deserve it. Not because our situation deserves it, but because you deserve it. So God, I pray that while we do it, you, while we wait, and while we look forward, you would help us to believe your promise. I pray today for the churches in our area, some of whom are looking for pastors, some of whom think they've found their pastor, some who need a pastor. God, I pray that you would, you would answer their prayers uh, for a good and faithful pastor, an under-shepherd who would love your people and feed them Feed them your word. I pray that the church, while they wait, would be able to worship. I pray, God, that for the churches that are around us to, um, to do the ministry that you've called them to do. I pray, we don't, I pray that our, this whole area in West Central Illinois would be filled with churches that worship and that serve and that share the gospel and that disciple pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'd have friends over on Friday night and watch movies. But uh, one of the three colors went bad.
You guys remember when like one of, if the, one of the colors goes bad on your TV, then the whole thing gets distorted. So we, if those of you that remember these kind of controls, I don't even know if modern TVs, you could do this. We had to adjust the tint to the extreme one side just so the TV would be mostly visible. But we, people still came over for brownies and ice cream and we would watch movies. But it meant that a lot of the movies I watched for the first time, I didn't, it kind of changed what the movie looked like because the shadows were deeper. So if it was supposed to be something that was dim and dark and difficult to see, then it became impossible to see. And it was just like, okay, we're just sitting here watching TV and I have no idea what's going on. The, everybody else who has seen the movie before goes, did you get it? Did you get it? And I'm like, no, I did not get it. Well, there was one movie we were watching one time. And if I'm ruining a 20 year old movie for you, I'm sorry. Uh, But one time we were watching this movie, and I thought it was set in like the 1800s. Uh, It's a movie called The Village, and I thought it was a movie set in the 1800s because it looked like the westerns I had grown up with, like families living out in the wilderness with, you know, homesteads and these kind of things. Well, they end up, uh, but I'm watching the movie, and I'm going, this does not, it looks like an old western that I grew up watching, but something's wrong here. It doesn't really fit. If you know the movie, then you kind of know why. Because what ended up happening is this, this whole movie revolves around this town where people had been fleeing from the world and the problems they had seen, thinking, we can go and make a safe place for us if we run away from the world. And so I, I was thinking of that movie, not all of the different plot elements, but that idea, because I remember being 21 at the time and thinking, I get that. I get that temptation to go, if we could just leave everybody else behind, we could be safe. If we could just, if if me and my kids, if me and, well, I didn't have kids at the time. I didn't even have a girlfriend. But like, if, if me and whoever could just get away and leave the bad people behind, everything would be okay. Do you feel any temptation like that? This kind of struggle with what is it, how do I live in the world as a Christian? What? What kind of attitude and relationship do I have to my neighbors, to my coworkers, to the, the, the state of Illinois, to the United States, to the world around? Like, what do, what do we do it? Some of us feel the temptation to run away. There are multiple different ways that you and I can be tempted to relate to that. But I was thinking of that feeling because today, and when we look at Genesis chapter 19, we're going to see what what the, the attitude and posture God calls His people to living in the middle of a world of sin. Go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 19. Just before this, God has shown to Abraham His plan. He's reminded him that I'm, God is going to give him a son through Sarah. But th- He explains to Abraham that He is going to judge the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the towns around it and the plains around it because the word the Bible uses is the shrieks have risen so high that God is going to bring judgment. He's revealed this to Abraham. And so this is where we pick up. Genesis chapter 19. The two angels, so then, so God sends two angels to Sodom and says, the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Verse 6, Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind them and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We will treat you worse than them. 
They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that He has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy this city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. Let's pray. God, as we open your word, we have our own temptations on how to relate to to the world around us. Help us to hear what you have to say to us from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. This, uh, this story has a lot of gritty, even sickening details when we go through it slowly. God has said, I, God knows what's happening, but has demonstrated already in, verse, in chapter 18 to Abraham, I am going to get personally involved in seeing what is happening in this city. I told you earlier, the word used is shrieks. God says, if the shrieks that have risen from this city, what they are, and so... The two visitors, the two angels, come to the city to check and see what is happening. And they go to the gate of the city where Lot sits in a place of leadership, where Lot sits in a place of influence, and he persuades them to come into the home, his home, and under his protection, which is what coming into somebody's home at the time, it meant protection, and it meant welcome, and it meant provision. In verses 4 to 11 explains the attack of the men of the city on these two visitors. I want you to notice, especially the detail, that it says, it repeats in multiple ways, every man, young and old, in the city goes here. This isn't a, a rough neighborhood with three or four bad guys, but this is every man in the city coming to attack these visitors. To rape these visitors. In verses 12 to 14, this is where the angels warn Lot and say, Lot, this city is going to be destroyed. Take your family, take everybody with you and leave this place. So Lot tries to warn his sons-in-law and the sons-in-law themselves think that he's joking that God would judge the city in this way. Then verses 15 to 22 then lays out for us Lot's salvation from God here. I read through verse 16 earlier. It says, For the Lord was merciful to him. Verse 17, As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. Verse 21, he said to him, very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of. But flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zoar. Zoar means little place. Here, Lot is saved. Even though he hesitates, the angels take him and his family by the hands and lead them out of the city. Lot looks and says, "This I can't run as far as you want me to run. And so this town's little place, Zoar, which would have been destroyed, ends up being saved because Lot says, I can run that far. Can you spare that place? So then, verse 23 to 29 explains the destruction of the city, or the cities and the plains. 
Verse 23, by the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah for the Lord out of, from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew these, those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Notice that the destruction here is wider than Sodom. It's wider than Gomorrah. It's over the whole plain. And it's to the extent where we still actually don't know where Sodom and Gomorrah were. It seems that it's likely that Sodom and Gomorrah are now under the south end of the Dead Sea, which is a land that does have sulfur tar pits. And so the destruction was so total that these places are wiped off the map, and so we read this, and we've been walking through the book of Genesis, well, the book of Genesis dealing with Abraham, and we go, what is the purpose of this story in the life of Abraham? This is Lot. This is Sodom. This is Gomorrah. Abraham's living somewhere else. And here, it, in these verses right here, it explains, here is the purpose. Verse 27 to 29 explains the relationship of this story to Abraham. That for Abraham's, even though God was going to punish sin, for Abraham's sake, God spares and protects Lot and his family. The, the detail most of us know best in these, these verses here it seems to be Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. The verse doesn't really explain a whole lot except that she disobeys the command of God through the angels and she's turned into a pillar of salt. While she's already been rescued, she turns back and turns to a pillar of salt. But then notice in verses 30 to 38, the, the, the final part of the story of Lot and his family. Verse, verse 30, Lot and his daughters left Zoar and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zoar. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day the older daughter said to the younger, our father is old and there is no man around here to give children, give us children, as is the custom all over the earth. Let's get our father to drink wine and then sleep with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night they got their father to drink wine and the older daughter went in and slept with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, last night I slept with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again and you go in and sleep with him so we can preserve our family line through our father. What a shameful family. Verse 35. So they got their father to drink wine that night also and the younger daughter went in and slept with him. Again, he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. Verse 36. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger daughter also had a son, and she named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites of today. And so this story where God judges the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and the plains ends up with Lot and his family in this disgraceful episode where he's not caring for his daughters and giving them husbands and providing for them in a home. And where the daughters get him so drunk he doesn't even know what he's doing. And they carry on their families in this way. This story that is one of the low points of the Bible, I think, is teaching us that God's justice will not be delayed forever. But it can be turned by a mediator. God's justice is is not going to be delayed forever. It's been delayed to this point. But it won't be delayed forever. But God is teaching Abraham and you and I, His justice can be turned if a mediator can be found. What I want you to notice is three lessons from this passage. First, expect God's perfect judgment. You see, God is getting personally involved in what's happening in Sodom. God, the king over all the earth, who is 
present everywhere because he doesn't have a body like you and I have, sees everything and knows everything, is demonstrating to Abraham, I get personally involved where sin happens because I will bring judgment. God is teaching Abraham and God is teaching Lot and God is teaching you and I that God takes sin personally. And it will happen one day. God has been patient to this point. We've already seen His promises to Abraham at times. That that sin will one day be punished in the land, but God's going to wait 400 years before it is complete so that He can show mercy for 400 years, but He won't show it forever. Here, the, I told you, the, this word I think is so important. That the shrieks of the city. And, I mean, we know these details are gross. The, the, we, the, the, the shrieks from this city of the kind of sin that was common in this city uh, is what has called God's judgment down even though He has shown mercy for a while. Here, the, the, the sin is written really large and grotesque so that everybody can go, yes, that's a bad city. We want nothing to do with that. But other places in the Bible explain there were other sins in Sodom. Sins like pride. Sins like people who are rich ignoring the needs of the poor who lived around them. There, were, uh, there are times in the Bible like Ezekiel 16 where God says, Israel, you are guilty of worse sin than Sodom. Not, not because, because the, on our list of a ranking of sin is homosexuality and rape, and we put all of these here, and God says, Israel, look at what you're doing. God, very clearly, Jesus says it in the Gospels, that the unbelief of Israel is a worse sin than the, city, the sin of Sodom. And so this sin is written large for us here. But I think we should not just go, at least I'm not like Sodom. Because the story of the Bible is that all sin gets God personally involved. And whether it's soon or whether it's later, will require judgment. God is writing judgment very large here. And so instead of us thinking of other people and their sins, we should look at this story and realize, unless my sin is dealt with, then one day I will be like Sodom. You can go to church your whole life. You can never commit adultery. You can never commit murder. And yet, if you're guilty simply of the sin of unbelief before God, of pride, of those kinds of sins, then the judgment of Sodom will look small compared to the judgment that we will face. And so we can, rather than pushing this away in in its grotesque, like, It's like a horror movie that's like, let me make this as bad as possible so you can beware. Like, we should listen and say, God, if this is what happens to Sodom, what's going to happen to somebody like me? If we read the the, uh, Sermon on the Mount slowly, where Jesus takes things that are common in you and I's life, and he says, you guys say, do not commit, your law says, or the law says, do not commit adultery. And Jesus says, but if you look at a woman lustfully in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. He says, you, the law says, do not murder. But Jesus says, if you hate or are angry with somebody, you are guilty of of murder. God gets personally involved in sin. And this story shows the judgment of God And we should take it to heart as our God will one day deal with our sin in the same way. Somebody will have to die and receive God's judgment for our sin, not just other people's, not just the person sitting next to you, not just the culture, not just another city. Like my sin is one day going to face this issue. I, um, there's a writer that I read in, they had us read in college named Flannery O'Connor and her stories were really, really weird because they involved normal people like you and I and, but, and eventually there, I was rereading those stories this year going, why did we read those and were those really good? But they're, they're normal people like you and I that you and I would know. But in the story, life, life, like, 
slaps people upside the head and makes them look in the mirror and go, you know what? Everybody else is not the problem. I'm the problem. It's perfect, perfect, church-going grandmothers who, li- who end up realizing because life has slapped them upside the head, everybody else isn't the problem. I'm the problem. And I think in the same way, this story here about Sodom and Gomorrah is supposed to slap us upside the head with the grotesqueness of it to say, your sin is a much bigger deal than you give it credit for. Your gossip and slander will one day require burning sulfur and judgment. Your bitter, unforgiving heart will one day require judgment. Your eyes that look on pornography or look on others with lust will one day require fire and brimstone. God might be patient right now, but He will not be patient forever. One day, all sin must be paid for. And so you and I are supposed to read this story and say, sin is awful. Second thing, the lesson from this passage is believe that God saves sinners. So yes, we're supposed to expect God's perfect judgment, but also believe that God saves sinners. I love the detail in this story where Lot, I think we need to give Lot a little bit of credit here. Simply because 2 Peter tells us that Lot was a righteous man tortured by what he saw happen in Sodom. Like, and what he said about his daughters, what he offered with his daughters is inexcusable. It is wrong. It is shameful. But because 2 Peter says that he was a righteous man who was being tortured by what he saw in Sodom, I think we have to give him some credit. But we see him and he like hesitates. God has said he's going to judge this city And he hesitates, but notice the detail. It's in verse 16. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. This story that has this grotesque, this horrible sin, this awful judgment, has this this note of grace where undeserving a lot is taken by the hand and led out of the city. Law is taken and rescued out of the city. Telling, and we see the same thing happen to the city of Zoar. Zoar is going to be destroyed. And yet, God spares Zoar. And so in this story where God's judgment is coming down, we also see God taking sinners by the hand and leading them to safety. And so instead of, in, instead of Sodom simply being a story of God's judgment, we also see this beautiful picture of what God does with us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, why is Sodom and Gomorrah here? Why does Abraham need to know it? Because not only does Abraham need to know that God's judgment is going to come, but that also God saves sinners, Abraham. God saves sinners, Abraham. So in your low moments, when you blow it with Pharaoh down in Egypt, Abraham, Abraham, when you blow it coming up in the future with uh, the men, the Philistines who live around you, Abraham, when you blow it with your servant wife, Hagar, God saves sinners, Abraham. He takes them by the hand and leads them to safety. You need to know that. I need to know that. Whatever sin comes to your mind this morning when we look at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and we realize God's going to judge my sin. Also here, God saves sinners like you and me. God comes and takes them by the hand while they're still sinners and leads them to rescue. But not only that, this, this story ends with this shameful story in Lot's family where Lot runs from the world doesn't provide husbands for his daughters, doesn't take care of them. His daughters manipulate and use him. Just that, I want you to notice that the, even in that story, there is a note of hope because God is saying, I'm not done with Lot. And the reason is because look at the very end. 
The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites today. To most of us, that doesn't mean anything. But the most famous Moabite of all time was named Ruth. One day there would become a woman who's, who married an Israelite man and then he died. She wasn't supposed to. She was an enemy. She's from a shameful family. She is not included in the promise of God. And yet God takes Ruth, welcomes her into his family. She becomes the grandfather of David, or I'm sorry, the grandmother of David, and the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. Because Moabites get included in God's family too. Shameful people like Lot's daughter get included in God's rescue too. And so you need to know that God is not done with you either. The people in your life, your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids and your classmates and your teacher and your co-workers and the people in Manchester and the people in the communities around us need to know that God's not done with those like Lot's daughters. God's not done with people like Lot who hesitate. God's not done with you yet. My kids have, they commented this last week that I have some t-shirts that are the lightest t-shirts they've ever seen. The reason is because they're very old t-shirts. And I've worn them at multiple different sizes and they've been stretched out and they've been, they have been washed and then dried and done probably thousands of times now. And the kids are like, Dad, these are the lightest t-shirts in this house. They're so threadbare. There's like almost nothing on this t-shirt. But the thing is, they're my favorites, Right? Maybe you have something like that. You've got some things that you're just like, I'm not going to get rid of them because I love them. Like, they don't look good. I probably shouldn't wear it around town, you know? Like, but I like it. And I'm not going to throw it away because it's my favorite. I was thinking of that this week because here, God says to Lot and his daughters, I'm not done with you. I'm not done with you. Sin is going to be judged, but Lot, you and your daughters and your shamefulness, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done with you. Not because you're noble and you're good and you've got it all together. Lot and, the do- and your family, I'm not done with you. And so some of us today need to hear, God is not done with you. Maybe you're here today and you say, I... I- want to know what it means to be taken by the hand and taken to safety. I want to know what it, how can I know that God will reach out His hand towards me and take me to safety like Lot and his daughters and his wife. The way that we do that, the Bible tells us, is through repentance and faith. Repentance is a changing of the mind and saying, God, I have lived as your enemy and as a rebel and disobedient. God, I will now follow you as my Savior and as my Lord. God, I will accept with these hands, I will accept the gift that you give me in Jesus Christ. That is what it means to be saved, to be taken by the hand. If that's you, let let today be the day of salvation. Come and grab and talk to me while we sing at the end of the service. You can grab me in the hallway. Like, reach out to me this week. Don't put it off. Let today be the day that you finally believe God saves sinners. Those who blow it. Over and over and over. God saves sinners through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. So this second thing here is believe that God saves sinners and that He's not done with you. But that leaves us with the question, how? How? How does God save sinners? What is God doing? How do we know? I want you to know this is the third lesson from the passage. The third lesson from this passage is this is a call to you and I to be a mediator. I want you to notice why Abraham is included in this story. In verses 27 to 29, it tells us that God spared Lot because Abraham stood in between and said, for my sake, be merciful and save Lot. And not only that, but notice what happens with the city of Zoar. Zoar was about to be destroyed, but Lot asked for God to spare it for his sake, and God listened. So running through this story of God's judgment, God saving sinners, is also this note of one man 
standing between God and sinners and saying, will you rescue them for my sake? Will you save them? This story tells us that God will listen to a mediator. God will listen to a mediator. He will listen to Abraham who says, God, for my sake, will you save? God, for my sake, will you save my family? God will listen to a mediator like Lot who says, for my sake, will you save this city and spare it the judgment that they would get otherwise? You see, that's the opposite of what we see in the life of Jonah. If we look at Jonah, if we look at Jonah, when Jonah has spoken judgment on the people, Jonah goes up on a hill to get a front row seat to watch judgment. Jonah is a horrible prophet. What kind of prophet says, God is going to judge you. Give me some popcorn in a front row seat. But here in this, Abraham and Lot say, no, God, for our sake. We know it's sin. We know that it's wrong. But for our sake, will you save them and take them to safety? And I, so I wonder here today, how many people and places are right now being spared by God because we are standing in between them and God and saying, God, for our sake. Like, like I told you that this, I was telling you the story of like, what, how do Christians relate to the world? How do Christians relate to the sinners that are around them? And the Bible has, is very clear that like law, he's called to flee. He has to flee the judgment that's coming. But we also see this note of Abraham saying, God, spare Lot. Lot saying, God, spare Zoar. I wonder how many people God is right now being patient with because we are standing in between God and them and saying, God, for our sake, will you wait? Will you take them to safety? Will you rescue them? How many people in you and I's life, maybe in our family, are we standing in between God and them and saying, God, for my sake, can you spare them? I know they are sinners. They've sinned against me. They've sinned against people. God, will you spare my in-laws? God, will you spare my cousin? God, will you spare my son for my sake? How many people in Manchester that deserve the judgment of God have, uh, are we standing in between them and God saying, God, for our sake, we know that it's coming. We know that it's right. But for our sake, can you take them to safety? Can you take them to safety? I wonder if we're more tempted to take the attitude towards our state of crossed arms saying, God, bring the judgment on Illinois. It's so bad. Or do we say, God, for our sake, please have mercy on our neighbors. I'm going to meddle for a second. For a couple hundred years, our state has hated the city of Chicago. Downstate, for a couple hundred years, has wanted to separate from Chicago. And I wonder if the godly attitude would instead be for people to say, God, for our sake, can you spare this city with 10 million people in it? We know your judgment is right, God, but will you spare them? I wonder how many countries on earth that deserve the judgment of God right now are receiving the, judge, or the, the mercy of God because somebody is standing between them and God. I think of a country like Qatar, or Qatar, however you want to pronounce it, where there's not a single Christian church and not a single Christian believer I wonder if there's anybody standing in between the, the country of Qatar and God and saying, God, will you have mercy on them? We know they deserve judgment. God, but, but will you have mercy on them? I wonder how many people groups around the world, maybe in India, maybe in China, maybe in Africa or South America, maybe they're even here in the United States, and could there be somebody standing in between God and those people and saying, God, we know we know their practices, we know their hearts, we know their sin, and we know that it reaches to heaven. But for our sake, could you spare them a little bit longer and could you send somebody to take them by the hand and take them to safety? I think this story of Sodom and Gomorrah calls us to begin to have the attitude of Abraham and Lot here and stand in between God 
and our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids and our cousins and our aunts and our uncles and our neighbors and our community and our state and the world and say, God, for our sake, take them to safety. So that's the third lesson. It's a call to you and I to be a mediator. But we know that it won't last forever. We see it in the life of Lot. There was not a, lot, there was not a mediator good enough to spare the entire city of Sodom. Abraham had said, if there are ten righteous people, God's like, there are not, there's not enough righteousness to spare Sodom. So we get to this point. And we say, God, could there be a mediator with enough righteousness to spare? God, could there be a mediator for me? My need for a mediator. Maybe you hear this passage today and this passage exposes your need for a mediator. You know in your heart of hearts your offenses against God. You can cover them up for a season, but your heart condemns you for all the things that you knew you should do and you have not done. Your anger against God, your bitterness against the world, your pride and your selfishness and your fulfilling of selfish desires. All the things that you knew were wrong and you did them anyway to satisfy yourself. Where is the mediator for you? Is there enough righteousness to save you? I want you to look with me at the cross where Jesus could not put His hands up to His Father and say, spare them. Instead, as He was suffocating and bleeding, as He died, He prayed for those who were killing Him and said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Look at the cross where there is a mediator who is good enough for you and for me. Look at, a, look at the cross and see that it's not temporary and that if you are in Christ, that all judgment has been taken and put on Jesus so that you are free and so that you are safe and so that your future does not look like Sodom's. I love... I. I went into this week thinking that I hated this story. I turned my stomach to read it. But when I look at it and I see the, the, the fire and the brimstone and the judgment of God coming on Sodom, and then I look at the cross and see all of God's wrath was poured out there so it doesn't have to be poured out here, I say, thank you, Jesus, for taking me by the hand and taking me to safety. And so you and I, if we will look to Jesus right now with the hands of faith, accepting Him as your mediator, Savior, and Lord, you can know that God's wrath is turned away from you. That His judgment is not hanging out there over you one day. Look to Jesus and go free. Look to Jesus and run to safety. This passage tells us that God's judgment will not be delayed forever, but it can be turned by a mediator. It has been a call to you and I to expect God's justice. To to believe that God saves sinners. to, To be mediators like Abraham and Lot. I want you to imagine with me what might change about your legacy from this passage. We don't know how many days you and I have. But I wonder what might change about our legacy when we're gone. When when one day, somebody in heaven comes and says, you stood between God and the justice I deserved. And you were the mediator I needed to give me time and God answered your prayer. I want you to imagine the kind of legacy that you could leave in your family. If your kids or your grandkids or your brother or your sister or your parents knew that you regularly stood in between God and them and pled for them. Imagine that kind of a legacy. Imagine answered prayer when God works in somebody's life here in Manchester, the communities around us, at your work, in the state of Illinois. Imagine imagine the joy when that prayer is answered and God has shown great mercy to Illinois, to Chicago, to your family, to your friends, to the country of Qatar, to to a people group that's on your heart, uh, known only to you. Imagine what ha- the joy in your heart when you realize the God of the universe listened to me and saved him or her, them. God 
God did a work that only he could do. And all I did is stand in between him and say, God, for my sake, can you save them? Let's pray. God, I thank you that when you said, Father, forgive him because he doesn't know what he is doing, you meant me. And you meant us. That you are the one who comes and takes us by the hand and leads us to safety. And I pray, God, that we would be people like that who take seriously the joy and the benefit that we get to stand in the righteousness of Christ and the boldness with which we get to ask for other people's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.